On my heart this morning was, if, if I were to see Jesus, if we were to see Jesus, would we have been able to recognize him? And that's been on my heart. And I was thinking if, if you watched a movie of Jesus, like The Passion of Christ or one of those movies, you always see that Jesus is very uh, prominent. They pick the best actor, the most prominent actor, and make him represent Jesus. And then for the disciples, they'll go and look at the other actors who are very, very you know, popular, and then they get them. And then for the rest of the people, they just get extras and fill them in. Um, with the paintings also, if you see the Last Supper, you'll, you'll always know which one is Jesus. Either he'll have a good robe on or something. There'll be something that will catch your attention. Even if you're in the middle of the movie and you walk in and you're like, oh, yeah, there's Jesus, there's the disciples, and then the rest of the people. But when we look at the scriptures, turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Verse 2. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, verse 2. And in, in the, uh, the latter part, it says, He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And later on in verse 3, it says, And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And now comparing that verse, he was not attractive. He was not something physically, if you were to look at him, where he would have stood out. And we know that on the day that he was, on the night he was betrayed, they needed a Judas to actually go and identify which of, the, which of them was Jesus. He was, very, he was alike. He was just like all the other disciples almost externally. There was nothing that stood out that they could say, oh, Jesus is the one with the, the blue robe, or he's the one which is standing on top. He's the one who's, by his speech, you'll be able to recognize. No, there was nothing that could distinguish Jesus from all the other of the disciples. And I was thinking, if I went back 2,000 years ago, we were all there on the dusty roads of Jerusalem, and we saw crowds of people, would we have been able to just look out in the crowd and say, oh, yeah, that's the one which is Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think we would have been able to recognize him by his external features and, and how he looked. But I do believe if I spent some time sitting down with Jesus and I heard him speak, he would speak to my heart, and I'd see the, his attitudes to money, towards this world, and all of those things. I would see that, that, that life, and that's how I would have recognized there's something different about this man. He might look so ordinary on the outside, but in the inside, there's some, there's a glory in this man that I've not seen in anyone else. The words he speaks are words of life. And I'm encouraged to every moment I speak, my heart, sit with him, my, the heart, my heart burns within me as I hear him speak. And I think about why is this important to me? Why is this important to us? Oh, we could all say, oh yeah, if Jesus was here today, I would know him. I'd be able to recognize him. But is that true? Would we have been able to recognize him today if he were here? And I see the test of that the test of if I would have known Jesus today is, can I identify a godly man today? Can I identify a godly woman today? Can I identify a godly church today? If I can recognize that, then I can say, you know what? If I was in Jesus' time, I would have been able to recognize him. I would have been able to recognize the apostles on that day. It's interesting. Um, the people who saw Jesus the most, who were the people who, who grew up with Jesus? They saw him from his young age. Who were those people? The people that... His family. his family. His family knew him. The city of Nazareth knew him. He grew up there in the midst of them. 
But if you look at Nazareth and they saw him, they saw him physically, they saw his appearance. What did it do to their faith? Because they knew him so well, was their faith very high or was it low? Did they believe in him? Did most of them believe in him? Turn with me to Matthew, chapter 13. Verse, verse 54. It says, he came to his hometown, Matthew 13, 54. He came to his hometown and began teaching in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and all these miraculous power, powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is, is not his mar- mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not, um, not all with us? Where, did, where then did this man get all these things? In verse 57, what does it say? And they took offense at him. They got offended. They got offended at Jesus, this Jesus that they grew up with. And then verse 58, it says, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. This person that they had been around all their life, they they were completely blind to it. Then I was thinking of the people who did have faith. Uh, Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 39. Those who, this is uh, the blind man, the blind man Bartimaeus. They told him, be quiet. And he cried all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And he asked him, what what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you whole. This man who could not see the physical Jesus, he had faith. He had faith in this man, Jesus. With those who grew up with him, who saw him, did not have. The neat thing is when we have, the multi- we have multiple Gospels is we can compare one account of something with the other. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 7, verse 2. Luke chapter 7, verse 2. We've heard about the story of the centurion. The centurion, uh, I always, I, I, I pictured in my mind that cent- the centurion actually walked up to Jesus and had this conversation But if you look at the account from Luke, it says that he did not physically go there and meet Jesus. Read with me in verse 3. It says, when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. This This centurion actually may have never seen the physical Jesus. He may have never seen what Jesus looked like. But at the end... He had this faith that Jesus commended him. He said, people are going to come from the east and the west like this man. What great faith he has. He has faith that I can do this for him. And I see that there's something that, by looking at the physical Jesus, there was something that people were struggling with. How could this ordinary man on the outside, who did not go to these great schools that we've been to, How could God be in him? But for the people who were blind, they didn't see him, this physical man. They had this faith that he was the son of God. I wanted us to uh, read this verse in John 9.39. John 9.39. This is John 9.39. 
And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Those who cannot see will see, and those who think that they see or see may become blind. And I see that. Those who think they see are blind, but those who do not see, those who are, you know, they did not see, they, were, they knew, they, they saw this Jesus. They saw, they were able to recognize this Jesus. I think I have a visitor here to, just, just one sec here. And I'd like the kids to uh, give me their guesses on who they think this is. Can you guys see? Guesses? Jesus? Paul? Who? Elijah? Elijah? Peter? Paul? Okay, now, now we can go to the adults. Elijah? Elijah? <laughs> when I'm, me when I'm older? <laughs> I was hoping that answer would not come. <laughs> so, um, this was my best take at, at a person um, actually, it's, it's Paul. It's, it's my, my take on Paul. Uh, we don't have in the Bible only a few things that we know of him. One, we know that he had a belt on. You guys might remember that who was wearing this belt is going to be taken. We know that he was probably small. Why? Why do we think he was small? Anybody? Guesses? Zacchaeus? Do you know why he do you, do you, do you know what scripture do you think that told us that he might have been a small person? He was put in a basket. Do you guys remember he was put in a basket and he was lowered outside the walls. He had to fit in that basket and so we think that he was he was a small person. He also may have had a lot of scars on his head and face and everything. Do you know why he may have had a lot of scars? He was beaten up. Many times he was stoned. One time he was stoned and left for dead. If he was stoned to the point of death, I don't think they were just <laughs> doing it lightly. He must have been scarred and bruised all over. And this man, this man, he says when he talks to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I was trembling with fear that's how I came to you. In weakness, I came to you and I spoke to you. This man actually wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. This man, the short man, scared, trembling. But if you were to see him, all the Corinthians, others could not recognize him. There was only a few people, Timothy, Luke, a few people that stood by him at the very end of his life. But yet, who was with this man? Who was with this man? Jesus was with this man. This man, God was with them. The people who looked at him externally is like, oh, Paul, your, your presence is very unimpressive. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. It says, he was very unimpressive in a person. And so... If we were to look at this man, we would, if we just saw his externally, we saw him trembling and everything, we may have said, hey, you know what, this man, God may not be with this man. Look at this other person, he's speaking out loud, he's speaking boldly, maybe the Lord's with him. And so we have to be careful as we look at people. I think Paul has to go now, so we'll, we'll say bye to him, you guys can say bye.
But I was thinking, why, 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 why was it that way, Lord? Why, why did you hide Jesus from everyone? Why did you hide Paul from this? Why, Jesus, did you say thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to babes? Why did you do that? If you look through the, the, the scriptures and see, at many occasions, they got, they got confused. They said, is this Jesus? How can he be Jesus? Turn with me uh, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 19. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he is this insane. Why do you listen to him? So that's one group of people. And then the other group of people, others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? The next verse does not say Jesus then came and explained to everybody why he was the Messiah. No. Did Jesus let them believe what they believed? Yeah. Were some of these people wrong? Yes, they were completely wrong. They had a wrong perception of Jesus. Yet he did not go and kind of convince them and say, you know what, your understanding is wrong. He never, he'd never looked to go and, and justify himself. Turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 40. It says in John chapter 7, verse 40, some of them were saying, certainly this is a prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Others were saying, surely the Christ is not coming from Galilee, is he? It says later on, the officers came to arrest him, and then they said, hey, we were, why didn't you arrest him? And it says here in verse uh, 46, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. They've never heard a person speak like Jesus. And then Nicodemus stood up for Jesus and he said, Our law does not, in verse 51, Our law does not judge a man unless he first hears from him and knows what he's doing, and what he's, knows what he's doing, does it? And they answered, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search, this, search and see that the, no prophet arises out of Galilee. And so this, this person was like, Nicodemus who was trying to support Jesus, he was like, the Messiah is not coming from Galilee. He's going to come from Bethlehem. Do you not know the scriptures? Could Jesus have not got up and said, wait a minute, I really was born in Bethlehem, but then my parents moved me over to Galilee. He could have justified himself and corrected it. Did he ever correct himself? No, he never corrected himself. The lives, the eternal lives of all these people were at stake, right? The lives, if they did not believe he was the Messiah, they did not believe that he could save them from their sins. Their eternal destiny was at hand. Yet Jesus did not take the time to correct their wrong understanding. And I look at that and, Lord, why, Lord? Why didn't you correct their understanding you had the opportunity to correct them and tell them that you're really the messiah why were you hidden from all of these people why did you let them believe what they wanted to believe and i was thinking about that it says if if we seek him with all our heart what will we do we will find him right and jesus is looking for that he's seeing who are who are the ones really seeking out for me and he will reveal them to, to him. Now I wanted us to turn with turn with turn to Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. And I wanted to talk about what's that thing that's covering covering us from seeing Jesus. Right? There's something that's covering Jesus from people seeing him. And what's that thing that's covering him? being a cover from, for, from us seeing him. It says here that there's a veil. Do you know what a veil is? A veil, something that's a veil that's covering. 
this, this is kind of like a veil too. You know, it's covering what's behind it. And there's a veil that it says in verse 13, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. And it says, We are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his, his, his face. So there's a one veil which is over our face. The second veil is in verse 14. What does it say? But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same, what? Veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. So that's the second veil. And the third veil is found in verse 15. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. So there's a veil over our face, a veil over our minds, a veil over our hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. But we all with unveiled face behold as a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into that image from glory to glory. And so I wanted to talk about that, that, that glory, because God said he wants to, he's talking about this glory that we will be transformed from one glory to another. And the first part of that is we have to look to Whenever a person, verse 16, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And then what, then what do we have to do? In verse 18, it says, we have to behold with the unveiled face as a mirror the glory of the Lord. We have to behold that. We have to see the glory of the Lord. And then we are transformed from glory to glory. Read with me verse 7, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Where is this glory it's talking about? It's talking about this glory that we're seeing. Where is that glory? But we have this treasure in, in earthen vessels. And this is... Uh, my, uh, my earthen vessel here. <clears throat> Can you all see it? This earthen vessel. And so, this earthen vessel is there and the treasure is inside it. And one thing, we, we all have this earthen vessel and all of us can, one of two things. One, we can preserve this earthen vessel. We can say, okay, this is my earthen vessel. I'm going to keep it safe. I'm not going to let anything come and hurt this earthen vessel of mine. If you come against this earthen vessel, I'm going to do everything I can to protect this earthen vessel. The only thing is, if the earthen vessel is, leaves on, is left untouched, the treasure inside, it's going to stay in there. Turn, uh, read on further. Uh, to verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. We do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And I used to think that this outer man must be, you know, as we grow old, you know, we lose our hair, we... Um, we lose our hair, we lose our eyesight, we become wrinkled and all of that. I was thinking that's the outer man that he was talking about. You know, the outer man is getting decayed. But that doesn't make sense. Everybody's outer man decays in that way, right? Everybody gets old. I felt that, I, I see that the outer man he's talking about is not us getting old because everybody's going to get old. Just because we get old doesn't mean our inner man is going to get renewed day by day. Read with me verse 8, 2 Corinthians verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, 
but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be manifested in our body. So as I, I look at this, God is showing me that the outer man, it, it's going to be afflicted, it's going to be perplexed, it's going to be persecuted, it's going to be struck down. And Paul is saying, you know what? We carry about this dying of Jesus every day. We're caring about it. This is what happens to us. And I was thinking about how this, this plays out in our lives. And if we think of afflictions, we're tempted to be jealous of one another. That's an affliction, right? That's an affliction that comes to, to us. We're tempted. I see another brother and that brother's getting honored. What, what, what comes inside my heart? A jealousy, right? One, I can preserve my, my earthen vessel and keep it from being heart, hurt. Or I could say, you know what? I'm not going to be jealous of this brother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to break this earthen vessel here and die to myself here, carrying the dying of Jesus. And then there might be two sisters. One sister is like jealous of another sister for something. And they can preserve it and say, you know what, I'm going to stay with this jealousy. I'm going to be jealous of them for, because they do this thing this way or that thing. I'm going to preserve my earthen vessel. Or else that sister can say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go into the ground and die and I'm not going to be jealous. God has kept me and this sister in the same body. If one member is honored, I'm going to rejoice with that member. Another hole goes into that earthen vessel. And then, maybe we're tempted to be angry. And we're, oh, I'm angry and I'm going to stay angry. I'm not going to give in to that other person. That other person's wrong and they're going to be wrong and I'm going to be angry with them. Or I could say, you know what, I'm going to be a broken man. Yes, there's something wrong in me and something wrong in that person, but I'm going to give in to it. I'm going to let that break this earthen vessel. This outer man is going to get hurt. I don't want to forgive that man. That person's done so much harm to me. I'm not going to forgive them. Or I could say, no, I am going to. I'm not going to let this flesh rule over me. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go and ask them for forgiveness. Yeah, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to break this outer man. I'm going around... It could be lust. Am I going to give in to lust or am I going to... No, I'm not going to give in to lust. I'm going to break this outer man. Receiving correction. Am I going to be offended if somebody corrects me? Oh, I'm not going to be offended. I'm going to break this outer man. Perplexed. I'm hearing of all these things and I'm fearful. What should I do? Am I going to give in to that fear? If I am, then I'm going to preserve my outer man. But I say, no, I'm not going to give in to fear. I'm going to say that the Lord's on my side. He's going to give me courage through this anxiety for tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to tomorrow. But God's saying, no, don't worry about tomorrow. Cast your cares on me. And you can see how this, this, this vessel, depression, I'm not going to give in to depression. I'm not going to be depressed. God is my greatest encourager. He's going to encourage me. There's nothing to be depressed about. Discouragement. God has forgiven me my sins. He's a father to me. There's, nothing, there's no reason for me to be discouraged at this time. And so you can see this affliction, persecution, perplexion, being struck down, all of that. What is it doing for me? What, what is all these trials doing for me? Anyone? What, what is it doing? What is it doing to my outer man? It's decaying. It's breaking this outer man. And if you look at this and you say, oh, you know what? This is a, this is a hard thing. All I see is a breaking and a breaking and a breaking and a breaking. I'm going through these trials and all of this. All that I get in return is this breaking and brokenness. 
then we can get discouraged. But Paul says, read with me the first, first verse of chapter 4. What does it say? Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not, we do not lose heart. <laughs> Why haven't we lost heart? And this is what I see is the reason we don't lose heart. You see that? Can you see this? The treasure inside, this life inside, would have always been hidden if my outer life was preserved. If I went through trials and I preserved my outer life, that outer man, that glory of Jesus would have never come out. And that's how the glory of the Lord gets manifested. He says, what does he say in chapter 4? He says, for we who are live are constantly be delivered over to death, verse 11, for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. 